Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family, and we would love to hear from you during our live show. So give us a jingle at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling us and you're outside North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980, and you can always send us an email, Jim and Joy at EWTN. Dot com. Well, today our guest will be Mike Aquilina, and he has authored over 50 books. And you've seen him hosted on many EWTN shows with Dr. Scott Hahn. He is also the executive vice president of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. It's a Roman Catholic research center that is based in Steubenville, Ohio. And we're delighted to have Mike Aquilina with us. And he's the author of another book. The book that we're talking about today is called A History of the Church in 100 Objects. It's pretty beautiful to have all these pictures mm -hmm. in the, yeah. here of objects. Yeah beautiful, beautiful pictures, and then the facts about them. And he worked on it with his daughter. He did. And uh, the website is fathersofthechurch.com, fathersofthechurch.com. A lot going on uh, in the world today in the United States of America. I wanted to mention in particular uh, an upcoming vote, I, I, if it hasn't taken place already today. It's a vote on the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act. You can call the Senate switchboard. There's a vote in the Senate. It's already passed the House. Uh, the president has said that he will sign it. Yes. But it needs to pass the Senate, and it's an uphill battle there. If you call 202-242-3121, that's the Senate switchboard, 202-242-3121. We've already called this morning for our senators. You just call that number. You, you tell them what state you're in, and they'll put you right through to the senator's office. You might even want to ask to speak to him or her and say, hey, I want you to vote yes on that uh, protection bill for unborn children. And, uh, you know, we've recently elected a senator here, a Democrat, which is unusual for the state of Alabama. There was a big conversation as he was running, whether he was pro-life or not. And votes like this, whether it passes or not, will tell you mm -hmm. if he's pro-life or not to some degree. So we're going to find out about our new senator. And I called him, and I'm praying, and I'm hoping that he's going to vote life. Just realize this bill is saying uh, the truth that it's conclusive that uh, pre-born children at 20 weeks, really 18 weeks and earlier, mm -hmm. feel excruciating pain. Right. Uh, the nerve development is even more tender than those who are born. And so this would abolish abortions from 20 weeks on. Some of you might be saying, well, I just thought that they were abortions through the first trimester, mm -hmm. through 12 weeks. That's a real misnomer. We have abortion in the United States of America through all nine months. All nine months, you can get an abortion here. Roe versus Wade, Doe versus Bolton together mm -hmm. made it possible to get an abortion through all nine months. This would stop approximately 20,000 abortions, late-term abortions in our country. And uh, no matter what, we need to hold our senators to account. Mm -hmm. Also, this week is National Catholic Church Week. Catholic uh, School Catholic, Week. Excuse me, Catholic School Week. Um, NCEAA.org, NCEAA.org. So we're celebrating Catholic education mm -hmm. in the United States of America. And this is so important for the renewal of our country and for the renewal of the world. If we can break the lock hold that public education is the only one getting the money and get some vouchers and mm -hmm. various ways to fund Catholic education and spread the distinct nature uh, of Catholic education whose benefits have been documented again and again and again. Quality education, great academics, the spiritual component, which is just irreplaceable, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. if children are encountering Christ himself through the sacraments or at least introducing that possibility to people who might not be Catholic. So go to that website, nceaa.org, learn more about Catholic Schools Week, and let's promote Catholic education. Well, we're thrilled because one of our son-in-laws is a Catholic principal, and our children are in Catholic education, and our children did Catholic education in high school, and it really does make a difference. So if you're on the fence and you may say, well, I'm in a, maybe a homeschool, or maybe I'm in a really good public school system, and I don't need to do that, mm -hmm. 
really pray because it's such a development of all of the virtues and the moral teaching yeah. and just so enriching to them. And this is unique intellectual Catholic mm -hmm. tradition, right. which would be too much to talk about and go over. So it's not just what well, we're all doing academics in the Catholic schools having a better result. It's a way of studying. Right. It's a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. It's the way you see the world. It's the way you see you know, the virtues in the world and, and how you think critically. And so happily, hopefully all Catholic schools are doing that. Mm -hmm. If not, they need to be. And so we promote that. Also coming up February 7th <coughs> is uh, National Marriage Week mm -hmm. USA. National Marriage Week USA. So you might want to look that up. And it's a special week set aside to lift up the sanctity and dignity of one man, one woman, a husband and a wife in that covenant of marriage and the children that are born from that union. And you know, this is a big debate. How mm -hmm. you debate reality, I'm not quite sure. And the law has changed uh, in our country uh, called marriage equality, so-called, but you can't change reality. Right. And you can't change the natural law. And the natural law is a man and a woman making a covenant, the children born from that union. And so look that up and, and let's promote the sanctity of marriage. Let's strengthen our own marriages and family and all together build a new culture of life. And we do want to give a great shout out to Walk for Life West Coast and EWTN and the fantastic yeah. coverage that they did. Father Joseph and Doug Keck did a wonderful job. Father all the, Mark, Brother John. They, what a team, they were out there. And you know, all the, the engineers, production crew, camera people, all the travel, all the sacrifice of families mm -hmm. that, that, that do mm -hmm. the sound people. It goes on and on and on to bring that to you. So thank you for your support. It was a great, great march and it was a great success and mm -hmm. great turnout. It was beautiful yet again to defend the culture of life from coast to coast in our nation. Well, we're gonna speak with Mike Aquilina <clears throat> now. What a blessing he is to the church, over 50 books and, and so much promoting uh, the faith, the history of the church, understanding the church in this context, a history of the church in 100 objects, amazing objects, artifacts. One of them is St. Francis's tunic. Mm -hmm. You should see that. And so he looks at these different objects, he and his daughter, uh, Grace, and they share about history at that juncture of time and what was going on. You're not going to want to miss Mike Aquilina. We'll be right back. Please don't go away. Welcome back. We well, are an important part of our EWTN family, and we would love to hear from you today during this live show. So maybe there have been times when you saw Mike Aquilina on television, and you thought, you know, I'd really like to ask this guy a question. Well, today is your day. <laughs> Call us at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling and you're outside North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. And you can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, and hopefully we'll use your question or your comment right here on the air. Well, I bring to you a dear friend of EWTN, Mike Aquilina. Usually you probably see him and he's hanging out with Dr. Hahn, or you've <laughs> seen him on Jeanette's show. You've seen him around, he is a familiar face to you. Today he's on at home, how fun is that? And so we're gonna bring him to you and we're gonna talk about his recent book, an author of the church in one, a history of the church in 100 objects. Great website, fathersofthechurch.com. Well, Mr. Mike Aquilina, thank you so much for saying yes to being on at home. Well, thank you for inviting me into your home. Well, we're glad to have you. Well, what we want you to do is tell our family at home, who's always seen you being really smart in a chair somewhere. <laughs> you're gonna be smart today, too. Uh -oh. But, you know, usually you're answering all these theological questions, taking, you know, you guys are having these great theological conversations. But tell our family a little bit about Mike Aquilina. Where were you born and raised? and Tell us your story. Well, I was, I was born and raised in the Scranton area, northeastern Pennsylvania, coal country, and I, uh, and I come from coal mining stock. Mm -hmm. you know, my, grand, my grandfather was a miner, and my, my father worked for a mining company wow. for most of his life. Um, 
and both of my parents were devout and about the best parents you could ask for. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful people. I'm the seventh of their children. I'm the last. Mm -hmm. They were 47 years old when I was born. Wow. And I was born uh, in 1963. So all of my childhood was taken up with the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council, which mm -hmm. is an exciting time to be alive, mm -hmm. especially in my town because almost everybody in my town was Catholic. Mm -hmm. It was a very Catholic area and, uh, and what went on in the church was, was kind of the thing you talked about. Mm -hmm. And everybody went to Catholic schools. Um, so I got 12 years of Catholic education. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to celebrate that for Catholic Schools Week mm -hmm. uh, this week. Um, yeah, so I got 12 years of Catholic education with the IM, IHM nuns. Mm -hmm. But you know, it was, a, it was a difficult time. It was a tumultuous time. A lot of things seemed to be up in the air in the church. And uh, when I was a teenager, it just wasn't holding together for me, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you, you, even in school, we'd hear some things that weren't quite right. Mm -hmm. Not quite what my parents right. seemed to believe. But uh, we, um, so I, I, I kind of fell away from the practice of the faith. Uh, it's interesting, though, that what brought me back to the practice of the faith was studying in, e in an enormous secular university, like Penn State, mm -hmm. where most of my <laughs> professors were not believers. Yeah. But they showed us history. Mm -hmm. And history was full of Catholic stuff. Mm -hmm. And they taught us literature. Yeah. And literature was full of Catholic stuff. Mm -hmm. And really, I mean, I was kind of pleased with this. Mm -hmm. I was kind of proud. That's my heritage, even though I wasn't practicing much. Mm -hmm. and, and I kind of made my way back through the witness mm -hmm. of these, these academic disciplines, mm -hmm. even though I wasn't learning it from, uh, from Catholic teachers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you, when you say you fell away, did you stop going to church? Yes. So, okay, so you just, you just kind of, did you go to other denominations or you just quit church altogether? You know, it's funny, I, I, I was, I did every now and then go because one of my friends wanted me to go to his mm -hmm. church, but I, I was never attracted mm -hmm. to anything else. Mm -hmm. To me, it seemed like it had to be the Catholic church or nothing. Right. There was nothing so substantial mm -hmm. as the Catholic church. And, mm -hmm. and the only people I, I, I encountered who didn't seem to get that idea were people mm -hmm. who didn't have contact with the Catholic church or didn't have much contact with mm -hmm. the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. How did your life cross with uh, Dr. Scott Hahn? Well, that's interesting. Uh, it was in the early 90s. My wife had just come into the church. We'd been married for about, about five years, and mm -hmm. she came into the church. Um, and, uh, and Scott Hahn, someone gave, gave my phone number to Scott Hahn, mm -hmm. and, uh, because he wanted to find a, um, a place where his friends could could do RCIA mm -hmm. in my diocese. Mm -hmm. Scott had been a Presbyterian youth minister mm -hmm. in, in my diocese. Mm -hmm. So all of these people wanted to become Catholic right. now that Scott had become mm -hmm. Catholic mm -hmm. and they were listening to his tapes. Mm -hmm. And so um, someone told him, hey, my, Mike Aquilina's wife just went through RCIA. Maybe that program's good. So he called me mm -hmm. and his friends did end up going through the program. So we ended up celebrating together. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and that's when our friendship began really. Wow, that's beautiful. And through Scott, then you got in touch with EWTN as well. You worked together, or how did you come into EWTN? Well, uh, I mean, goodness. I, well, I, I, I edited in the Catholic press for, um, for a number of years. I edited the Pittsburgh Catholic, the diocesan mm -hmm. newspaper mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh. Uh, and then I edited New Covenant magazine, which was a magazine of Catholic spirituality. Mm -hmm. And Scott Hahn wrote for me. Uh, when I was doing both of those jobs. Mm -hmm. And so we were in touch all those years. Mm -hmm. And um, and then uh, in, I believe, I believe it was 1999, uh, EWTN asked Scott if he would consider doing a series of his own. Mm -hmm. And he, he said he would, he would do it if, if they could talk me into doing it with him. Mm -hmm. So we did it together. That's amazing. And, and we've done 10 series mm -hmm. since then. So. Wow. And the rest is history <laughs> and, yeah. and you're still, still going on. Well, 50 books approximately you've written. Yes. Yes. And uh, you've written this latest book, A History of the Church in 100 Objects or Artifacts. So what's the origin of this book, this style of writing history? Oh, wow. Well, um, I mean, almost all of the work I've done is, is related to history. I'm a history buff. And, uh, and my, my mission, I think, is to, to make history accessible to non-specialists. Mm -hmm. You know, great work mm -hmm. is being done right now by archaeologists and great work is being done by historians and it's Catholic stuff mm -hmm. again yeah, right. mm -hmm. but you know the word doesn't get out to people mm -hmm. because this research isn't reported in your local right. newspaper mm -hmm. too much so I want to take that academic research 
and make it available and accessible to the, the widest number of people. So most of my books have been about history. This particular book was actually proposed to me by the, the editor at Ave Maria uh, Press, yeah. and, uh, and, and that's Tom Grady. And he proposed the idea, and I said, that's a great idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you've got 100 objects or artifacts. Yeah. So these are real visual images, pictures. As I mentioned at the outset, it was amazing to see St. Francis' tunic. Mm -hmm. And I said to you, I mean, is this really the tunic? And so, yeah, it really <laughs> is. There's little patches all over it and all this stuff. And, and then you really only take about a, a page or so to describe each one, or two pages maybe. And you did this with your daughter? Yes. Is this the first book with your daughter? Yes, my daughter Grace. Yes, the first book I've, I've written with one of my children. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so uh, it kind of grew out of homeschooling, really. Uh, we, we've homeschooled our six children, and, and we've had a, a, a wonderful experience of it. And the one thing that I like best about homeschooling is that it's a conversation. Mm. The parents are learning with the mm -hmm, children yeah. mm -hmm. and, and you're carrying it forward that way. So I would yeah. be talking to the kids, we'd be having these great conversations about history. Yeah. Well, this was like a continuation mm -hmm. of that conversation after Grace was no longer being homeschooled, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah. She was in college and we started working on this book together. Yeah. So beautiful. I, I love the wedding ring. Tell us about that wedding ring. Well, it's a Byzantine wedding ring, mm -hmm. a gold wedding ring, mm -hmm. uh, uh, probably from the 5th or 6th century. But we do have r rings like that mm -hmm. as er as from as early as the 4th century. So it may go back even further. Um, what's interesting about it is that it shows the couple, the two, mm -hmm. man and wife, mm -hmm. Uh, and it also has Christian symbols mm -hmm. around it. And what it's showing is uh, is a couple united in Christ. Mm. You know, so it's showing that marriage is something sacred. It's mm -hmm. considered a sacrament. It's mm -hmm. it's holy. It's an image in time of of an eternal truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Saint Paul brings that out, mm -hmm. and and they're living it out yeah. in their marriage. Mm -hmm. What we have to have to realize is that. Uh, Christianity was a revolution in family life. Mm -hmm. It was a revolution in marriage. It was a revolution in parenting. All of these things changed essentially with the dawn of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And that's why mm -hmm. Christians were, were mm -hmm. persecuted by mm -hmm. the pagans, mm -hmm. by the Romans, because it was seen as a threat to the social order. Mm -hmm. it's, it was seen as um, uprooting Roman family values. Right. Look what happened to John. When he confronted Herod, right? That's right. It was like this. This was not good, and yeah. they were like, "Are you a Christian? We're going to get rid of you." Right. That's right. So it was to his death as he was defending what was true and holy and right about one man, one woman, and the sacredness and the were covenant there, of marriage. Were there wedding rings before Christianity, or was it was the wedding ring of Christianity different? Or, or the wedding know? ring of Christianity is different because it's celebrating this as a sacred event. That's what makes it different. Mm -hmm. And it's showing um, the, uh, the, uh, the man and woman united by certain uh, Christian ideals and Christian values, theological concepts usually. Mm -hmm. So they would put, they would put like, um, uh, they would put uh, these, these theological concepts there uh, with, with the couple, the picture of right. the couple, like harmony, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, uh, because the harmony between Christ and the church was supposed to be the kind of harmony mm -hmm. that would exist in your home afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that word, the Greek word for harmony, mm -hmm. would be there, mm -hmm. and it would be there with the image of the couple. Right. There were wedding rings before that, but they were not celebrating a sacrament. Mm -hmm. Right. And what kind of harmony was there between man and woman before Christianity and our Lord's teaching of equality of the sexes, yet uniqueness and difference, complementarity. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess those themes perhaps were not there before then. I mean, it seems very male oriented and dominating and the man called all the shots, including life and death of the children, whether they should yeah. live or die. Yes, marriage and family were a wreck. Mm -hmm. in the, the late Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, they were a wreck in the early Roman Empire. It was so bad, adultery was so common, and you could kind of see where this came from. Uh, girls were usually married off at age 11 or 12 mm -hmm. to a man who was not of their choosing, and the man was usually about 30 years old. So there, there wasn't often a connection, mm -hmm. a friendship, mm -hmm. a fellowship between you know, husband and wife. The, the girls knew why they were there. More like property. Yes, like mm -hmm. property. Mm -hmm. They were there to produce a son. Mm -hmm. And once they produced a the son, there wasn't a lot of use for them. Mm -hmm. Divorce was easy, and it was very common. Adultery 
was very common. They say that in second century Rome, third century Rome, the number one industry was private investigators mm. because you had husbands and wives suspecting the other of cheating mm -hmm. and, and hiring these private investigators. This is the kind of world that Christianity arose in. It mm -hmm. wasn't pretty. Mm -hmm. Marriage was not a joy ride. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so Christianity came along, you know, and Paul said all these things like, husbands, love your wives, mm -hmm. you know, wives, love your husband. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and Christians took him at his word. Mm -hmm. They took him seriously, mm -hmm. and they tried to live that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and it was a revolutionary thing. Now, um, once they started that, and they showed what a happy home could be, you know, that was immensely attractive. Mm -hmm. right? And it's quite likely that that was the engine of evangelization mm -hmm. uh, because in, in, uh, in a little bit less than three centuries, Christianity had conquered the Roman world, not at the sword, mm -hmm. but just by its witness mm -hmm. in yeah. the Roman world. Yeah. They had no power to do it. They mm -hmm. couldn't impose their religion on anybody else, but people wanted what these couples had. Yeah. And how would Christianity treat the offspring, the, the children that came from their union? How different was that from the Roman time? Oh, it was hugely different. Mm -hmm. uh, they welcomed offspring and in great quantity. And you know, the thing is that the, the, the better relationships between husband and wives made for uh, more children, mm -hmm. frankly. You mm -hmm. know, that these happy couples tended to have more children and they welcomed the children. Mm -hmm. You know, if, uh, for a, a pagan Roman couple, they were after having that one son who would replace them and carry on the family name, most uh, female offspring uh, were put to death at birth. At birth. At birth. So yeah. they were delivered. They were and delivered. And then the yeah. father made the call as to whether or not this child gets to live or die. There was a ritual for it. Mm -hmm. The midwife came to your house. You know, the mother got into the birthing chair. The mother produced the child. The child was placed on the floor. The, the father was called in. And then the father could do one of two things. Could either lean over and pick up the child, raising up a child, mm -hmm. we call it, right? Mm -hmm. He could, or he could just turn on his heel and leave the room, and and the child at that point would would either be drowned in a bucket of water by the mm -hmm. midwife, or left at the edge of town, at the garbage mm -hmm. dump, in order to be scavenged mm -hmm. by the birds of prey, mm -hmm. or taken away by the pimps, mm -hmm. so that the child could be raised in prostitution. Yeah. Yeah. This was very common, mm -hmm. you know. Of, that we have the census records from the city of Delphi, and out of 600 families registered, only six had raised more than one female child. Oh my goodness. So all those girls mm. were going out to the dump. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is the kind of family life, it doesn't make for happiness, mm -hmm. it doesn't make for joy. Mm -hmm. But Christians were different, they set themselves apart, they lived by a different standard, and people wanted yeah. to have that smile that Christians could smile. And they actually risked their lives going to those, what was called the abandonment walls, yeah. where you could abandon your child on yes. the wall. So abandonment, exposure, various forms of infanticide and abortifacient drugs were, were being used. And so you're saying the church though lived differently. They were a community of people. They had that ring of a man and a woman in the harmony in the family and equality of all of the members, yet distinction and complementarity within it. And as St. John Paul II said, this is already written upon the heart of every mm. human being. But don't be afraid to share <laughs> the gospel of life, because they may not know that terminology, yeah. but there's something about the sacredness and dignity of every human being that's already there if they could just see that. Yes. And that's what the church was doing at that time, at the risk of their lives, yeah. uh, to live in this way, which was so countercultural and so beautiful and, and attractive and people were drawn to it, we need to take that page and live that today, don't we? Yeah, absolutely, you know, uh, and it was everybody's job. Mm -hmm. uh, see, right now we're on television and this, this signal goes out to millions of people. Back then, the Christians had no access to media mm -hmm. and there were very few media mm -hmm. to have access to. Christians had no power. They couldn't get the word out in any other way. So it was up to these married couples to kind of radiate Christ through their lives, mm -hmm. through their homes, through their children, through their grandchildren. Those were the ambassadors mm -hmm. taking Christ out into the homes of others. And, and, and it worked so effectively. Think about it. These are not theologians taking the word out. These are Christians, most of whom could not read mm -hmm. and could not afford to own a copy of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. But they knew the gospel of Christ. They lived it and they, they radiated it to their mm -hmm. neighbors and they made their neighbors want it. Mm -hmm. That's Benedict's teaching, isn't it? Uh, to paraphrase him, 
that Christianity was not necessarily a new code, a new moral gift that was giving. It was this real encounter with the living Christ who had walked the face of the earth, who was now yes. made present, and they were transformed, they were converted. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the apostles. It wasn't a new doctrine or teaching. This one that they hung out with, who was crucified mercilessly, had come and appeared to them, and they were changed, and that's what was going down with the first believers. Uh -huh. So you need to be able to say, I was blind, and now I see. Mm -hmm. um, you need conversion. Yes. And they were just going out and saying, he's alive, he's transforming our lives, we respect all people, and that's yeah. what was happening. And it worked, it mm -hmm. worked. I mean, evangelization took place at a remarkable pace. The church grew at a rate of 40% per decade for over 200 years. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Now, my parish has not grown at a rate like that mm -hmm. ever, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? But 40% per decade, the church grew. And, and, uh, and really conquered the Roman world. That's a remarkable thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well it's interesting because you're, you're a hundred objects or artifacts and you were mentioning we're here on TV and one of the objects are the satellite dishes here at EWTN. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you get permission for those pictures? <laughs> By the way. Okay, so the satellite dishes are here, Catholics on television. So you're sharing history. I'm going from you know, the beginning of, of the church, and you take it all the way up to these satellite dishes that are taking place and getting the gospel out there. I took that picture with my cell phone. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Well, the well, go ahead. We, I mean, we need to take a break. Oh, we do. And okay. um, then when we come back, we'll finish more with you. So don't go away. We'll be right back more with Mike Aquilina. We'll be right back. <laughs> back. Well, remember that we want you to be a part of our show. So if you're at home and you're listening, you think, I have a question for Mr. Mike Aquilina, we want you to give us a jingle at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling and you're outside North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. And you can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, and hopefully we'll use your question yeah or your comment right here on the air. Well, we're having a discussion about one of his latest books, one of more than 50 that he has authored. The name of this book is called A History of the Church in 100 Objects. You can go to his website, fathersofthechurch.com. Yeah, contact us. I dare you to stump Mike Aquilina <laughs> so, <laughs> on live TV. <laughs> so 100 objects, you're using the objects to, to help convey what the faith is about, but also period of history of time. You have the Church of the Apostles and the Martyrs, the Church and the Empire, the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, Renaissance and Reformations, the Age of Revolutions, the Global Village, and all these different images for those times. I just love it and I could see myself sitting down with my 16 grandchildren at mm -hmm. various ages and you know looking at those images and sharing a little bit and you know, people learn in different ways, but here you have the visual mm -hmm. way of learning, just yes. seeing it. I mean, they're gonna be so interested in all these beautiful, beautiful images and pictures. It must have been a real pain to get uh, permission on all of these, or at least most of these, or whatever you had to do. How hard oh, was that? It was, it was very, very <laughs> difficult. And we, um, we, you know, some of the images we wanted, we couldn't get, uh, just because uh, the, we, we couldn't get the permission granted. But the, um, but it's a great way to teach history. If mm -hmm. you could get people to see something, to visualize right. it, yeah. you, you, you capture their imagination. Mm -hmm. And what we tried to do in every chapter is begin with the object, begin with an artifact. Mm -hmm. And we tried to use ordinary things whenever possible. Right. So there's, in one case, it's a shoe. Mm -hmm. In another case, it's a pen, mm -hmm. uh, an and, uh, auto mechanics wrench. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things that are, that are just ordinary, I, household items mm -hmm. in a lot of cases mm -hmm. and to go from there into a story and uh, the story tells the story of a person mm -hmm. and uh, you go from the person into the uh, the era mm -hmm. the historical era mm -hmm. so it's a more engaging way to learn history I mm -hmm. think than just memorizing dates. Right, yeah. right. Let's Which one is your favorite object? Oh that's a good question. Um, I think uh, the the bookshelves mm -hmm. of St. Ignatius Loyola mm -hmm. uh, and the reason for that is Ignatius was, um, 
was a ne'er do well. I mean, he was a he was a soldier, but he did, wasn't living a a, a very good life. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a ladies' man, and uh, and he liked to party. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so he was injured in battle, and he had a long convalescence at his sister's house, and he was going crazy with boredom. Mm -hmm. And his sister had a shelf of books, so he was just he wanted to read mm -hmm. just to relieve his boredom, and wouldn't you know it, all she had was a shelf full of religious books, mm -hmm. Lives of the Saints, and they weren't even really, uh, they weren't works of theology mm -hmm. or anything like that. They were just Stories popular Catholic Saints. books, yeah. popular mm -hmm. Catholic mm -hmm. books. And he started reading them, mm -hmm. and he had a conversion experience. And so since I'm writing books that are popular books, they're mm -hmm. not works of heavy theology, it gives me a lot of hope, mm -hmm. that story. And mm -hmm. when I look at those bookshelves, that, that what the work I do can can really make a difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it yeah. is making a difference. Tell us about uh, this one artifact, the certificate of sacrifice. Mm. So you have an image, I guess, of an actual certificate. And uh, why was this relevant in Rome? Did everyone need a certificate of sacrifice? Who were they sacrificing to? How did this confront Christianity? Not only in Rome, but throughout the world, really, the Roman Empire, because this was from the third century, okay, and the, uh, the rule of the emperor Decius. Now, his legislation was um, kind of, took, it took persecution to the next level. Mm. He wanted to smoke out all of the Christians, and the way he did it was by requiring sacrifice of everybody in the empire. They had to sacrifice to the gods, specifically to the emperor's genius. And it didn't have to be a big thing, mm -hmm. just a pinch of mm -hmm. incense would mm -hmm. do. But once you did, then you would get your certificate, the libellus, the certificate of sacrifice. And if anybody asked you, mm -hmm. you could just produce it, mm -hmm. okay? And so we have, we have hundreds, thousands of these that have turned up from the sands in Egypt and in other mm -hmm. places. Um, uh, and, and a lot of people are fascinated by that. Um, because it's, uh, it's something that shows you the cost of discipleship. Mm -hmm. You know, that, um, that, uh, that you lived in real danger if mm -hmm. you weren't carrying one mm -hmm. of these in your pocket. What, were the Jews required if they were Jews in Rome to do this? Now, Jews were usually exempt, okay, because they did not pose a threat to the Roman order. Okay. They weren't proselytizing for Judaism, and very few people wanted to, to take on mm -hmm. the burden of the law. Mm -hmm. So there was not that problem. Uh, that, they, the, that the Romans had with Christians. The problem with Christians is that they wanted to go out to all the world and mm -hmm. tell the good news mm -hmm. and get everybody in on the game. Uh, that, um, that didn't sit well, especially because so much of what they were proposing, these Christians, mm -hmm. would upset the Roman social order. Mm -hmm. mm. Wow. Well, f financially, right? Just for all the fees you have to pay to sacrifice this, to oh, have sure. all, everything. It's like, no, this is working for us. You know, this is how our government's running. At the beginning of the 100s, you have uh, this, this uh, uh, provincial governor mm -hmm. of Bithynia writing to the emperor, and, and he's talking about it in economic terms, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that he's getting complaints from these people because... There, there's a whole industry right. set up to raise the animals right. for sacrifice, right. and then there are the people who are selling the animals, mm -hmm. the people who are transporting the animals. They saw Christianity as a threat to the economic sure. order. As now, so then, follow the money. <laughs> it's <laughs> bad. <Absolutely. laughs> yeah. Well, we have an email that says, today's culture seems as bad or worse than ancient Rome. With all the tools available, why is it so hard to get the Catholic faith to the, uh, up to the secular world? And this is from Karen from Brighton, Michigan. Well, as I said before, um, uh, we, we do a lot with media. You know, EWTN is wonderful. We have a lot of great websites, mm -hmm. Facebook presence, all of this stuff. There are a lot of people evangelizing through media. But I think uh, that has to take it, that's only a beginning, mm -hmm. all right? And uh, what, what needs to happen next is that kind of witness we were talking about, which is a personal mm -hmm. apostolate. Mm -hmm. Individual Catholics and Catholic families need to be radiating Christ to their neighbors, mm -hmm. people next door, people in their neighborhood, and, and changing their lives by getting mixed up in them, mm -hmm. by being true friends. Right. I think it was friendship that converted the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. friendship and nothing less. Mm -hmm. People found that 
the Christians were their most reliable friends. Mm -hmm. They're the people you could always count on for a ride. Mm -hmm. They were the people who would come through with a meal when you were down on your luck. Mm -hmm. All of these things that we associate with friendship today mm -hmm. were valued then, and that's what converted the empire. It wasn't media. It wasn't power. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about the ability to stand in the public square because the Christians did not have that ability. They did not have that freedom. They didn't mm -hmm. have the right. So it comes down to love and yes. kindness. And that even happens in your own family. I mean, you might have brothers and sisters who maybe aren't walking the Catholic faith or maybe they fell away from their faith. But love and kindness and being out there and being a witness. Yeah, and and when marriages fail in families and they're still looking at you like, okay, why are you still married? Yeah. You know, it's like, well, who are we following here? When yeah. Joy and I ministered in another Christian tradition, in the community where we live in the inner city, still live there now for 38 years. I can remember graduating seminary, being ordained in that particular denomination, and living in this community, uh, which was, which is quite impoverished, and uh, and uh, you know, not many dads in the home. Probably, I'd say 90 percent no father in the home. Wow. And I can remember when we first started the ministry, just a bunch of kids just kind of hanging out, especially boys, all times of the day and night, and I took a football and threw it out there, started playing football with them, got a weightlifting bench, did weightlifting, and, and I thought to myself, I said, Lord, what am I doing? I'm playing football and I'm lifting weights with these kids, and they're <laughs> coming this out. Degree, I, I picked the seminary, I picked, like, what is this all about? And like the Lord said to me, I felt like he said to me, the best thing you could do for this community is to love your wife, mm -hmm. stay married, and invite these kids into your home. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. But if, if we don't have that, that life and that integrity, so it's really about community and inviting them to a different way of living, yes. a different way yes. of life, yes. mm -hmm. and for them to say, Gee, maybe that's an option. And you have to represent marriage. Yeah. What, what is marriage? What does it look like? Why is that beneficial? Can that really happen? What's the benefits to children? And this is what we need to do, and we will prevail. We will multiply. But what you're saying is just critical. It was about friendship and about community. Yeah. There's a great line from St. Jerome. He's writing in the fourth century. He said, the eyes of all are turned upon you. Mm. Your, house mm -hmm. is fix uh, your house is set upon a watchtower. Mm -hmm. Your life fixes for others the limits of their self-control. Mm -hmm. Your life fixes for others the limits of their self-control. So what, what happens is that people see in a good Catholic home, mm -hmm. they see that, you know what, you really don't need to gossip. Mm -hmm. That's not a need. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's necessary to a social relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't need to look at pornography. Mm -hmm. You can resist that temptation. Mm -hmm. You don't have to live that way. So people will not learn that chastity is possible by watching television. Right. That's not how they're going to learn, unless mm -hmm. they're tuning in right now to this mm -hmm. show. Right. right? <laughs> um, but, uh, but most people aren't, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. They're not going to learn chastity from TV. They're going to learn chastity from you mm -hmm. next door. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And even uh, I think of our work at the Pregnancy Medical Center where we have clients coming in who their sexual integrity has already been compromised mm -hmm. and they're 14, 15, 16 years old. And so you get to represent yeah. um, and say, okay, so you've made different sure. choices. Now let's reset this and let's make better choices because you were made for more. And sometimes it's, you have the um, father of that child, they may or may not be married, coming in. And like you were saying, in the Roman household, the father went up or down. We are literally looking at babies in the womb mm -hmm from about five weeks to 26 weeks. And they're all in there looking. We're called Her Choice Birmingham Women's Center. Yeah. And we go over all the choices. 40% of our clientele are there coming for abortions. Mm. And so that father, we're making the case, and that father's going to go this way or up. Yeah. Yeah, this yeah. is what's happening today. Mm -hmm. And we're making the case for that child. And we're saying to them, these are the realities. This is what's going on. And you can be a part of this community. We're not going to go anyplace. We'll walk with you through this whole thing. Yeah. And some of them are Christian people, you know, so it's a new evangelization. And we need to, to share once again, we as Christians, we live differently. We get pregnant, but we don't have the option of killing our offspring. Absolutely. You know? And, and that was a great concern of the early church because abortion was so common then, mm -hmm. as was infanticide. So one of the moral issues that were most pressing in the first century, second century, third century was abortion. Mm -hmm. We have a paper trail condemning abortion and infanticide like no other moral issue of that time. Mm -hmm. So this was something that the church was set against 
from the very start. Mm -hmm. It's it's part of who we are mm -hmm. as Christians. But to come into a community yes. where that's being lived, like the pregnancy medical centers, and yeah. say, here's a different way of living. And, and some of them say, well, I seem to recall that someplace, or maybe that is a different way, because out here they're not saying that. And you're saying, come into this community. We'll support you all the way through, and after this child is born, we'll, we'll help you along the way. So these pregnancy centers, medical centers, are really communities of the church and of love right on the front line. Yes, you know, it's interesting. Uh, one of the chapters in our book is on the rise of the hospital. We have a little, uh, a little medicine jar in there called an unguentarium. Yeah, I was going to go to that, but I couldn't pronounce it. <laughs> Can you pronounce it again? Unguentarium. unguentarium. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, and it's a uh, it's a, a little prescription bottle, really. It would be hold an ointment or something mm -hmm. like that that you would be given from a doctor in a hospital. Um, before Christianity, there were no hospitals. Mm -hmm. Okay, there were developed civilizations. You know, if you look back through the the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Chaldeans, all of these people, they had developed civilizations but never a hospital. Mm -hmm. right. They could not make it economically viable. Who's gonna pay for this? Mm -hmm. But Christians just did it. Mm -hmm. They created hospitals during the time of persecution when there was a plague. They were there to serve the others, just like you're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bring mm -hmm. the others into this community of healing, and then the people you help, right. when they're healed, they mm -hmm. have that gratitude, right. and they want to be part of that community. Mm -hmm. They want to be part of that love forever. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, not only could they not, difficult to make it work economically, but you need that philosophy, that way of thinking, because I would imagine back then, and it's growing even so now, these are a life is not worth living. Mm -hmm. Why would we save back then? Mm -hmm. Elderly people or severely yeah. handicapped people or whatever it might be. Or someone who's just, just sick, let, let them, them die. die. Or let's, let's take them out. Mm -hmm. right? Or right. just get rid of them because All this is things. just for those who are mm -hmm. strong that are gonna survive this. With what you've learned you know, in, in history and, and in this particular book, you know, history repeats itself. Where mm -hmm. are we in this time? What lessons can we learn? What do we need to be about at this juncture in history as Christian people? Catholic people. Uh, in about a minute and a half. <laughs> <laughs> what our Lord said. A minute. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Mm. You know? Yes. You have faith in God, have faith in me. You know? Do not let your hearts be troubled. We're in a crisis right now. Mm -hmm. We're always in a crisis. You know? History shows us that. The church is always in crisis. It's always terrible. Mm -hmm. It's always the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And things always come out better. Mm -hmm. But there's a new crisis, mm -hmm. you know. Right. This is going to be our work as long as we're living on earth. Mm -hmm. We're never going to get beyond crisis mode. Mm -hmm. And uh, as one of the saints said, these world crises are crises of saints. Mm -hmm. We are called to be the saints in the midst of that crisis who bring that peace, you know, to, to others so that their hearts won't be troubled. Mm -hmm. Mike, thank you so thank much. You. It's a beautiful close reality and truth and hope, thank you, you're a gift to the church, mm -hmm. you're a dear friend of this network and of millions of people out there. The book is a history of the church in 100 objects. Mike and his daughter, Grace Aquilina. Go to fathersofthechurch.com. We'll be right back, don't go away. part of our EWTN family and we would love to have you join us live right here on at home and you can be a member of our studio audience. It's 2018 and maybe you're thinking you know I want to go to Irondale, Alabama and visit EWTN and then make my way to Hansville to the Blessed Shrine, which would be a wonderful place for you to be. So, and see Mother Angelica's resting place. All you need to do is contact the EWTN Pilgrimage Department, send them an email, pilgrimages at EWTN.com. Give them a jingle at 205-271-2966 and make that happen. Well, right now we're gonna go all the way to Rome to hear from Joan. Joan, what do you have for us today? Well, greetings from Rome to everyone at home on a very sunny day here, and I hope the weather is like that wherever you are. Now, you might remember that last September, 
Pope Francis established the Pontifical Theological Institute for Marriage and Family Sciences. And what he was actually doing is replacing the John Paul II Pontifical Institute for Studies on Marriage and the Family. Uh, John Paul II had set this up in 1982 following a synod on the family and before his beautiful document, a Familiaris Consortio. Now, Pope Francis explained at the time last September that this new institute would look at issues pertinent to marriage and the family with realism and love, while also, of course, staying faithful to the church's teaching. Now, just last Thursday, the institute inaugurated the Gaudium and Spes Chair, dedicated to studying, quote, the interaction between Christian and secular thought. And Gaudium and Spes, by the way, of course, is Latin for joy and hope. Now, the inauguration was marked by a letter from Pope Francis to Archbishop Vincenzo Paglia. He heads the Academy for Life, and he also is the Grand Chancellor of this institute. And the Pope noted that, quote, Gaudium in Space was promulgated on the final day of Vatican Council II and was able to express and give form to the profound intentions that guided the calling and unfolding of the Council. Now, Francis said he was very happy that the Institute, quote, has taken up a particular commitment to keep alive the attention to that conciliar document and to deepen the study of it in order to make ever more fruitful its precious legacy. And he said that this new chair fits in well within the horizon of your particular academic mission towards marriage and the family. And of course, Gaudium and Spes, we, we come right up to today, to the 2014 and 15 synods on the family, and Pope Francis's document on, on those synods, Amoris Laetitia. Now, given our intention of this show at home to all questions regarding marriage and the family, obviously, we'll be staying on top of this new institute and its work and its documents. But uh, time's up here as usual, so back to you at home. Joan, thanks so much for another wonderful report and uh, she's sharing mm -hmm. about Pope Francis, the ongoing mm -hmm. work uh, to present in mm -hmm. our history, in our time, the sanctity of marriage and of the family. Mm -hmm. It's so good to have you on board, Father Leonard. Mm -hmm. And you know, we were speaking with Mike Aquilina, mm -hmm. uh, a history of the church in 100 objects, and he was speaking about the ring, mm -hmm. uh, a wedding ring mm -hmm. at that time and how marriage and the family as a sacrament mm -hmm. marriage and what flows out of that was absolutely revolutionary mm -hmm. at that time. And here we are 2,000 years later, nothing's changed. Mm -hmm. Nothing. You know, marriage, the family, the revolution mm -hmm. of marriage and family, the church cannot mm -hmm. change that teaching no. and uncompromisingly, unwaveringly mm -hmm. must stand for a, a husband and a wife mm -hmm. in that covenant, that sanctity of marriage and the children born as, mm -hmm. as the, the chief building block mm -hmm. for civilization and for society. Oh, yeah. Your thoughts today, Father? Oh, well, it's good to be here. Good to see you both. Uh, I don't think I've been here since last year. Mm -hmm. you know? That's <laughs> right. I think you're right about Too that. Long. Happy New Year to Happy you. Happy New Year. <laughs> yes. Well, well, praise the Lord. Yeah, uh, you know, Mike's work is, uh, is is fascinating, and you know, it's very interesting how you you bring up about marriage and the and family life, and the, you know, Joan Lewis talking about that, and it's important that that uh, we foster this. You know, uh, you know, Mike was talking about the media and things like that, but that we bring about more of these types of shows and uh, um, productions that um, that help foster and encourage yeah. family life in the home because that's as, as the church teaches a building block in society you know mm -hmm. the, the children they have a good family life you know they they, they can they can trust one another they can um, they can work together they, they know how to work in community yeah. and so they can bring that out to society you mm -hmm. know and yeah. and, uh, and then there's true leadership it develops yeah. in the home mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think of uh, John Paul II now, mm -hmm. St. John Paul II, and one of his addresses, and I don't know if he was addressing you know, large groups of young people, whoever it was, mm -hmm. but he was, he was passionately saying, mm -hmm. you know, I propose to you love. We propose love mm -hmm. and, and agape love, mm -hmm. sacrificial love, cross-crucifixion mm -hmm. love, you mm -hmm. know, that we propose, that this, this is the way, those who find their lives, you're gonna lose your life, and those who mm -hmm. lose your lives, you're gonna find your lives. Mm -hmm. I propose the way of love. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is, we're proposing. Mm -hmm. And we need to propose it, you know, through EWTN and, mm -hmm. and through the airwaves. We need to propose it in the way we live, as he was saying, mm -hmm. we just need to simply live the faith mm -hmm. with integrity, the ups and downs of it, oh, yeah. receive forgiveness to ourselves, get back up, 
walk in the way of love and invite people into our lives and into our community mm -hmm. where they can watch people yeah. who are not about themselves but are about their wife or mm -hmm. they're about their children sure. and the children are about the parents and the wife is about the husband like the Trinity you know mm -hmm. Jesus oh, yeah. isn't about mm -hmm. Jesus Jesus mm -hmm. is about the Father right, right. the Father's right. about Jesus and the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit's about Jesus and about the Father he ain't about the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. seems to me this way of love mm -hmm. and will win the world but yeah. we've got to be about it in our homes in our communities mm -hmm. in the nation in the world over the airwaves everywhere knowing that Christ will prevail that's right and, uh, and you know as we're saying that love starts in the home you know it starts it starts in the home and you know, that love develops, you know, even increases, especially as a family grows through the years, you know, and as they suffer, you know, the suffering can bring them together, yeah. you know, and, and love is produced there. You know, they, you, in a family, you give to one another. I mean, you all know that. You all are good parents and good kids and stuff. But that's, that's where it begins. And, and then speaking also of love, as you, as you speak it to, um, as you were saying, you says that, uh, it reminds me of, uh, of evangelizing, and but the St. Paul's words. Be all things to all men. You were talking about that. Mike was talking about that. And, you know, uh, going out there in, in love and right. having compassion, understanding people, knowing where they're coming from, you know, being all things to all men. When, you know, as Paul says, when I was weak, I became weak. When I, was, when I went to the yeah. Jews, I became a Jew and a Greek, yeah. mm -hmm. and Greek, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yes. yeah, that's, that's, all, that's evangelizing with love, you Amen. know, meeting people where they're at. Beautiful. Father, give us a blessing that we might continue in this way. Lord God Almighty, we ask for your blessings, God, especially, of Lord, of, of growing in compassion, growing in charity, Lord, so that we can radiate you, God, to mm. all people and be a light to all nations. And we make our prayer in the name of Jesus the Lord, and may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, yeah. Father. The Lord has always provided what we need at every juncture in history, and he'll do so again. Remember the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act. Get to the Senate switchboard. Call your senators, 202-242-3121. That's 202-242-3121. Let them know your state. Call your senators. Tell them to vote yes to protect innocent human beings, at least from 20 weeks and beyond. Tell them to vote yes. God bless you. Keep it on EWTN. Altogether, we're building a new culture of life, marriage, and the family. Bye now.